Uh, hey everybody, I am attempting to make a video, which I have not done for an extraordinarily long time. Uh, and I'm going to be flipping back and forth between uh, the um, sheet you're supposed to be filling out and the lecture. So hopefully you can hear me. Uh, you'll probably also hear my husband talking and my kids yelling and my dog barking. But that's enough about that. So uh, ideally, you have done number one already. Uh, and the question uh, that you had for uh, number one uh, that you were supposed to answer uh, was that you were supposed to answer what was the biggest advantage. You can just use this sheet, biggest disadvantage, and then who should win the war. That one should have just been done by yourselves. And then uh, number two, I think I got to this in one of my class periods, but not so much into the other. How does underestimation factor into advantages and disadvantages? And uh, one of the things we had talked about was that um, the fact that Great Britain underestimated the colonists does in fact matter because of the type of war that they are fighting. Um, in other words, the colonists don't actually have to beat the British. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a second. Uh, and so now we're looking for the answer for number three. What was impressive about George Washington? Uh, and so uh, we talked about this, right? The, the uh, advantages you guys all mentioned this. Uh, okay, so let's talk about George Washington. So um, there he is looking quite handsome in the uniform that he himself purchased. And we had talked about how he was really one of the wealthiest men in the colonies. And that was primarily because he married a super wealthy w widow, Martha Custis, a widow who had children who he raised as his own. And by all accounts, you know, they quite loved him. Uh, and he, uh, you know, was a slaver, can't get around it, fact. Uh, he did manage his farm really well. He was never in serious debt. Uh, he did free all of his slaves uh, when he died. But because Martha was actually wealthier than him, she had more. And none of those people were freed. Uh, so, you know, he comes with I don't know. He's complicated. Let's leave it there. So he did have to build a professional army and coordinate, coordinate the militias, which he did a lot of this with Alexander Hamilton's help. And he had to encourage common citizens and volunteer soldiers to support the war, even when it seemed the British were destined to win in the early years of the revolution. So on the one hand, you could say, well, we know that there was tons of desertion. How good did he do? But he did actually do pretty well. And there are a couple of important battles where George Washington and what he meant to these white colonial soldiers was a lot. Uh, and he meant uh, a lot to them and, and, and they meant a lot to him. And he did encourage them to keep going and keep fighting in very difficult certain circumstances, particularly at the Battle of Trenton. And so of all the things that we can say about him, he's quite inspiring to many colonists. Uh, and we know that in the future, he is going to win election almost completely uncontested, right? Like nobody will even run against him uh, because he's so popular and he wins unanimously. Uh, and this happens actually, you know, much later. This isn't until 1789. The revolution doesn't end until 1783. But this is really, you know, a testament to who he was to many of the colonists. So I know there's a whole thing that maybe I don't think kids usually know this anymore, but like I was brought up being taught that, you know, George Washington never told a lie, except for one time. And that it was that he didn't chop down his father's favorite cherry tree, but he in fact did. And then he fessed up to it and took his punishment. And uh, I don't think that there's really any validity to this story. But I think, you know, with all myths, we can learn something from them. And I think the thing that we can learn from that myth is that many colonists held George Washington in quite high esteem. And this is very important to the uh, revolution and it's important to uh, the young nation as the way that people felt about George Washington uh, was then reflected on the things he was a part of. So they loved George Washington, so they loved the revolution. They loved George Washington, so they loved the new constitution, if that makes any sense. So um, whether or not he's earned this re reward, I'll leave that to you to decide. Um, but as you know, and as we're learning, there really isn't anyone who isn't complicated in our nation's past, which is of course complicated and messy and disgusting and sometimes beautiful. So uh, 
again, you know, there's George, there's our, uh, we have two different armies, right? We have several different armies that are fighting. We have the, you know, Continental Army and then the Colonial Militias. Uh, your book does a nice job of outlining the differences between them. If that's of interest to you, please go and look at your book. But we know that the desertion rates are higher in the Colonial Militias than in the Continental Army. Uh, and we know that they're funded differently. Um, but almost all of these men were promised land in exchange for fighting. And so we can all guess what that's going to mean for Native Americans. Um, and they were uh, funded differently, so they were armed differently. In some cases, they weren't armed very well or trained very well. But uh, someone, I believe in my second hour, mentioned that guerrilla warfare was used by the colonial militias and army, and that is correct. And if you don't know what guerrilla warfare is, I'm not saying guerrilla like G-O-R-L-L-A, like the, you know, like the ape. I'm saying guerrilla is in like the way that the Spanish word for war is spelled. Uh, and it means that you fight not necessarily using military rules, but like you might hide behind a tree and then shoot, which seems like the super obvious way to fight an army that can um, out technology you and out train you. Uh, and, you know, obviously they, the uh, militias learn this from their wars with Native Americans. Uh, and so we also know that civilians were fighting and we'll get to that a little bit more when we talk about women. Uh, so hopefully you have an answer for number three. And then our fourth question was, of course, uh, what were women doing during the revolution? And so I'm going to address that as best I can, being that woman is, of course, a pretty broad term for all the people. So let's just start with uh, an easy one. Native American women were probably just living their lives uh, because honestly, the majority of Native people sat this war out uh, or remained neutral. Uh, some Native American women would have been, you know, following their husbands to war, but of course staying in their village. And other Native American women uh, maybe would have been supporting the British, British side, but would have been in a similar situation if their tribe uh, was fighting on the colonial side. Uh, African American women, many were enslaved. Uh, so as we talked about before, they might have tried to run away. Uh, they might have tried to run to the British lines for freedom. Uh, or they may have just stayed enslaved, right? It just depends on what their situation was and what they were able to do. Um, free black women, however, probably were supporting the revolution as the words of liberty and freedom being echoed all throughout the colonies would have really rung differently in their ears as they know that many of their probably friends or family members or just you know people they you know felt a connection to were enslaved. Uh, and so those words would have rung differently to them. So I think a lot of African-American free women would have thought about supporting the revolution. Uh, as far as white women are concerned, many of them uh, did not want to be left alone on the frontier. And so they follow the armies. This was something actually that made George Washington quite angry that all of these women were like following his armies everywhere. But they were doing things like laundry for soldiers or cooking for soldiers. Or in some cases, like of Molly Pitcher, who's, who's shown here in these two portraits, they would have been potentially fighting, not like really like picking up guns necessarily, but maybe assisting, you know, the story of Molly Pitcher is that she, she uh, they, her, her name actually isn't Molly Pitcher, that's just what they call her, because she brought water and was helping with a cannon during a, a, a really important battle. But I think that the majority of women were probably, you know, finding ways to make money uh, either following the soldiers, maybe they were prostitutes, probably most were doing laundry and cooking. Uh, and then some women like Deborah Sampson here, and there were enough of these women that it's, you know, like historically relevant. They were dressing as men and fighting uh, because women were not allowed to fight. And so uh, we know that these women were doing this because when veterans awards were granted, many of them sought those rewards. And so we know that um, at least there's enough of them that it's just, you know, that it's worth mentioning. I don't think it was like thousands or something. Uh, okay, so I'm sorry if I didn't cover every kind of woman. It gets a little complicated. I did my best there. Uh, okay, so uh, hopefully you have an answer uh, to uh, question number four that was about how did women participate. But now we're talking about like, what did the British have to do to win? What do the colonists have to do to win? And then explain the difference, which I feel like I've already covered, but I'll just cover again. So, uh, you know, our Revolutionary War has a lot of different battles. Typically, 
you know, we only talk about three. If you want to do like a military history course, God bless you. That's amazing. That's really not my jam. Um, but if you are really super into it, I do know the book goes over more battles than I'm going to go over. But one of the things that I do want you to notice is that, um, again, the Revolutionary War doesn't end in 1778. This is just a picture of, of the campaigns in that era. The war actually ends in 1783. But, uh, you know, the war initially, you can see quite a bit of it is in New England or in the mid-Atlantic colonies. And again, like New England being a hotbed of Patriot support, this probably makes sense. And then one of the attempts, again, by the New Englanders is to attack Quebec, you know, forever hating their Catholic neighbors and wanting to take that territory. Um, but that is an unsuccessful campaign. And as far as the British are concerned, what they want to do is get New York so that they can try to cut New England off. Uh, and they're actually kind of successful, right? Some of you that are interested in the Hamilton musical know that uh, George Washington is, has to flee Manhattan. He isn't able to secure New York, uh, but that's the attempt there. Eventually what the British are going to do is they're going to try to move into loyalist areas. So they'll move into the South in an attempt to, uh, you know, drum up loyalist support uh, and then move in, you know, cut the, break the colonies in pieces and divide and conquer. But that doesn't work because many of the Southern colonies are quite angry about the British policy uh, towards freeing slaves. And so then it, uh, they get a large amount of support. Um, the colonists get a large amount of support anyway uh, as they turn their backs on the British. So the American Revolution, um, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I answered the question. So again, remember that the key thing is that the colonists just have to not stop fighting. And the British have to actually defeat the colonists, but not completely wipe out the colonies, right? Uh, that's what they have to do. So the job of the British is way more difficult than the job of the colonists. Again, the colonists just have to keep fighting. So I kind of alluded to this in the other hours um, on, you know, last week on Friday, but this is essentially the situation that America finds itself in in almost all the wars post-World War II. We have to uh, essentially um, destroy our enemy without destroying the nation because our goal isn't to destroy the nation, it's to win hearts and minds. But it's really hard to win hearts and minds when you're pointing a gun in someone's face. It's just a, a challenging thing, right? Uh, so, you know, this is what happens to us in Korea, in Vietnam, and in both Iraqs and Afghanistan. And as you know, the outcomes of those wars are mixed at best, if not a loss. So uh, it is a quite challenging position to be in. Uh, it is also the position of the Northern Army in the Civil War as well. So the American Revolution, this maybe is our next question, which might be six. The American Revolution begins at Lexington and Concord. And that is the subject of our, uh, of our common assignment, which I'll do a different video about. Uh, and then um, British victories from uh, 1776 to 1777 made an American victory look impossible, but the tides kind of turn. Uh, and so this is what I was talking about with the British seizure and burning of New York, right? Like George Washington's main objective, he does want to keep New York, of course, if he can, but really ideally he just doesn't get captured, which he manages. Um, and then this question I think leads us to, uh, we have a question about diplomacy in the war, it might be question seven. So uh, from the beginning of the war, really the whole thing is that Americans need allies, right? We need foreign allies who are powerful. I mean, we can do it quite a bit with smuggling, but ultimately the American colonists really needed to have support uh, of a real Navy, right? Which we don't have because the British blockade, the British blockade all American ports. Uh, a blockade is when you, you, know, you put ships and you stop anything from coming in and out. And it was quite effective. So we really did need another Navy to come in and assist us as the colonists really don't have a Navy. And ultimately the French seemed the most likely choice, but of course the French just fought a war and lost. And they maybe aren't interested in provoking another war with the, with the British uh, as they're sort of licking their wounds maybe we could say from the French and Indian War. So, uh, well, you know, what they really need to see is that we're serious. And so the Americans wrote the Declaration of Independence partly as a way to say to the world, like, we are serious about this breakup. We are never going back. Britain blows. But like, you know, it doesn't, 
it doesn't necessarily convince anybody if we can have some success on the battlefield, right? Uh, so we send like our most favorite diplomat, everyone's favorite man, Benjamin Franklin, you know, uh, here in this portrait, he looks quite old, but he would have been old when he was sent there. And I know we laughed about this before that I told you that all the French ladies at court were quite interested in uh, Benjamin Franklin in ways that would not be appropriate for me to say in a recording. Uh, but I think that we know what we were talking about there. I just can't even believe it's real because I look at that face and I think, why? Why? But who knows what the French are thinking? Anywho, uh, ultimately, uh, it is a, a battle that gets the French on board. Uh, and then once the French uh, swear their allegiance to the American colonists, the Dutch and the Spanish do as well, which is maybe less than helpful, but not hurtful. Uh, so. Um, they do agree to join us uh, after the Battle of Saratoga in 1777. And so that is why, you know, when we talk about the three most important battles in the American Revolution, it's, you know, Lexington and Concord, Saratoga, and then Yorktown. And so Lexington and Concord being the first battles, Saratoga being the battle that convinces the French to join us because we beat the British unexpectedly. And then, of course, the Battle of Yorktown being the final battle. So this is a turning point because France joins the Americans as an ally. And there's one person in particular, the Marquis de Lafayette, who, of course, those of you who love the Hamilton musical know all about. Uh, the Marquis de Lafayette, it's a, he's a character in the Hamilton musical, and he is um, a dear, dear friend to George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, um, James Madison, and, uh, of course, Alexander Hamilton. All these men, great, great friends of his because he is... Um, a true believer in the cause of the American Revolution, not just wanting to get British back, but a believer in what the ideals of the of the Declaration. And he wants to, to join us in that quest for liberty. Uh, and he does. And he is, uh, of course, a, a great ally to us. Uh, that's why, you know, there are streets named after him in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have things named after Lafayette here in the state of Minnesota. Probably every state does. Uh, and, of course, his uh, a sculpture of him, a bust, or a, a painting of him exists in all the men's homes that I described. Um, Washington, Hamilton, uh, Jefferson, and Madison. Uh, so, again, Saratoga, Turning Point, and then the Revolution. And Lafayette joins and trains. There he is looking very rakish, I suppose. Uh, and then it really did shift the, the tide uh, in favor of the Americans. Uh, and so uh, when we talked about why, you know, George Washington is important, he really rallies his troops at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Again, this is like um, a testament to George Washington that he can get his troops through this very, very cold winter they spend with ill uniforms and uh, not enough food, and he gets them to continue the fight. Uh, so they're near starvation at Valley Forge, uh, but he convinces them to fight on. Uh, and then finally, the battle, the war concludes at the Battle of Yorktown. So for those of you that haven't ever thought about wars this way, like, you know, there's all these different battles that are all part of a singular war, right? Uh, and so uh, by 1781, Washington traps the army of British General Cornwallis between the Kenton Army and the French Navy with the help of Madison, and, or excuse me, Hamilton, and also uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. Uh, there's some war type pictures. Hooray. Uh, okay, so uh, this is considered the, the day the world turned upside down. Uh, and then I'm going to go back to our sheet just to make sure that I'm covering all of the things that I should be covering, right? Uh, so first battle of the American Revolution. Oh, it said to describe it. Let me go back then and describe it. Um, there were, uh, I think I kind of did this already, but just to make sure uh, that you've got it covered, the um, British are coming basically to get guns and to potentially capture people like um, Sam Adams or some of those other uh, individuals uh, who we've talked about in the Sons of Liberty and uh, the American colonists recognize that that's what's happening and so uh, the Minutemen meet them in the field of battle they shoot a couple of times uh, some people die and then the British move along and they meet them again at Concord some people die and then everybody runs away so there's not really a conclusive battle I would say uh, but it is in fact the first time soldiers are shooting at each other that would be how we would describe it. Uh, so I think I talked about diplomacy. That was, again, the act of trying to get a country 
on our side, uh, talked about what's important about Saratoga and the French position, uh, and <coughs> Yorktown, of course, being important because it's the final battle. Okay, so let's look at number 11. What difficulties are awaiting new Americans in negotiation with the British and the French? And then, of course, what ended the war? Uh, and we'll talk about that. Okay, so, and then we'll move on to number 10. So, uh, what difficulties await uh, the Americans, just really quickly, quickly, once they manage to defeat the British, are, um, well, how are they going to negotiate, really, with the French? There were some fears that the French would just try to take over our country, because they had just assisted us quite a lot, or maybe that the Spanish or the Dutch would. So there were some concerns about making sure that the Americans were able to hold their own at the Treaty of Paris in 1783, when they all sides agreed, of course, not Native Americans, uh, all sides agreed to come together and talk about what the end of the war would be. Uh, the other thing I guess I would say was that they had created a government called the Articles of Confederation, which was terrible. Uh, and those of you that read Chapter 7 know this. It was really not a very good uh, or effective form of government, but it had gotten them through the American Revolution. But now we've got to establish you know, our own government, our own treasury, um, everything, you know, that the British had been essentially providing for us, we now have to do on our own, uh, in addition to, you know, maintaining an economy, etc. So this was uh, quite a difficult challenge. Uh, and so the Treaty of Paris officially ends uh, the American Revolution, and I wanted to show you this painting. This is actually what this painting looks like, and you could see some of the individuals in the painting surely you know that this is Benjamin Franklin. And so we know that the Americans were painted, right? And some of the French were painted. And over here was supposed to be where the British officials were sitting, but it's blank because they were so annoyed that they even had to do this, that they refused to sit for the painting. So I guess what I'm trying to tell you is that I don't think the British really think this is over. And when we get to the War of 1812, you'll see that they in fact did not. Uh, and they were a little salty about the ending here, although they felt they had bigger fish to fry and just didn't have time for a war with the colonists. They kind of were thinking, we'll catch you later, uh, I guess, when they left. In other words, they thought that we'd flounder and fail as a nation and that they could just swoop in and take us back whenever they wanted. Uh, so here's North America in 1754, right? You can see it's all these uh, European nations making claims. And then we get to 1763, and we're down to just basically the Spanish and the British. And then, of course, so after 1783, Americans have declared their independence. So now there's this new guy on the scene, the American colonists, right? Uh, but we can see that there are other groups still there. The Spanish are still there, and the Russians have now made a claim. Uh, so I'm going to go back to our sheet here to make sure that I've answered all of these questions. Uh, the American uh, rivals after the war are Spanish, and the French are always there, <clears throat> in, uh, especially as they're going to sell. The Spanish are going to exchange that giant territory with the French, so they're always there. And then, of course, the Russians and uh, the British. So why did the British really lose? Uh, I guess they didn't really lose, right? Uh, they really didn't. It was more that they just decided to stop fighting. Uh, I think the French really assisted us. We can't deny that. So I know that people, especially World War II fans, like to make fun of the French for being so terrible, but honestly, we wouldn't be a nation without them. Uh, there's just simply no way. Uh, and so we owe them that debt, most definitely. But I think it's also fair to say that what the British really thought was, we're gonna get you another time, so goodbye for now. I think maybe, and also that they were just sort of like, this is just bothersome, forget it, I'm not dealing with this at the moment. Might be the way that they thought about it. So I don't really know if the British lose so much as that they chose to stop fighting. Um, so there are quite a lot of casualties on the side of the Patriots, and quite a lot of them were di died of disease and exposure. There's really no medical uh, treatments at this time, uh, and there were smallpox pox outbreaks all across the colonies whenever this was happening. So the British lost far fewer soldiers. Uh, it's important to point out. Uh, I also uh, have this next question here. Uh, I think we're moving on. Um, as far as the effects of the war, um, you know, there are many deaths. There are many people who are shattered. And what's left to do is to create a new nation, which is quite extensive. Government, economy, etc. 
Uh, and then let's talk about number 13. How did Native Americans and African Americans experience the war and its aftermath? Uh, well, African Americans uh, have fought in every war that takes place um, once, uh, you know, people, white people set foot on uh, North America. So uh, there are 5% of total soldiers for the colonists, uh, nearly 300. 30, or I'm sorry, 30,000 uh, fought for Britain. Of course, we know it's because Britain was willing uh, to free them, but also they might have just felt more in line with Britain. It's possible. I mean, it's hard to, I can't see into every person's heart, but that would be my guess. Uh, and so, well, we know that many African-Americans left. Uh, they would have left and gone either to free black colonies in Nova Scotia or other free black colonies in other parts of Canada, potentially went back to Britain, uh, but we also know that many died. And to be fair, Britain sort of abandoned a lot of people uh, and they were just returned to slavery. Uh, I also imagine there was probably instances of free blacks being forced into slavery if they couldn't pr prove that they were free. I'm sure a lot of terrible things happened. Uh, one thing I do know for sure is that African Americans who did fight on the side of the colonists uh, for freedom, most likely did not get what they were deserved, if I had to guess. Uh, I'm sure they weren't, uh, and I'm sure they didn't, just based on what happens in the past, usually. Uh, okay, and as far as Native Americans, most who, who fought in the war did side with Britain, uh, and so uh, that would not have turned out good. Uh, the Iroquois were forced to move into Canada after the war. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so that, um, I think the, for most Native Americans, you know, dealing with the U.S. government is going to be difficult and it remains difficult uh, to this day, right? It's never going to be an easy thing. Excuse me, I'm going to have to get a drink of water here. Okay, so I think, I hope I answered uh, those questions. Uh, women really did not benefit uh, from their participation in the war in any way. Uh, they sort of just go back to how things were. And that's really going to be uh, the situation that we're going to see uh, for most women in wars until maybe a little bit of a change after the Civil War in the sense that it becomes more normalized for women to be in nursing. But I would argue it really takes World War II to make a significant difference for women after the war. And even then, I'm not sure that all of it lasts, you know. Uh, so... Uh, number 15, uh, you have that final question, and I have uh, the question here on the slide. So um, what I'm looking for you to think is, like, did any of these groups benefit from the American Revolution in any way that you think might have been real or lasting? And I guess, you know, I would say white men most definitely did. Many got land. Uh, so I think there's an argument to be made there. Uh, on a scale of 1 to 10, at least 10, you know, where 1 is the least and 10 is the most, how revolutionary is this revolution? And so I'm asking you to answer this question without really potentially understanding completely the government that gets created um, much later in 1787. Uh, and whether or not that government is, of course, good, uh, that's also going to be up to, for you to decide. But uh, how revolutionary was this, this revolution? Um, when you think socially, obviously we did cast off Britain, so it's a success there. But what do you think otherwise? I just want you to answer what you think. Okay, so if you have any questions about this or, you know, I have COVID and I'm kind of dumb right now. So maybe I forgot to say some things. Uh, so just like, you know, send me an uh, email. Uh, I'm sorry that this went on as long as it did. Uh, and thank you.